this morning online now and later this week. Let us pray. O oh God, it is through the abundance of your steadfast love that we enter this your house of worship. We will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead us, O oh Lord, in your righteousness because of my, our enemies, those in the world who will attack communities of faith. Make straight your way before us. We will give thanks with our whole heart. We will recount all of your wonderful deeds. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will sing praises to your name. Amen. Now we will be led in our call to celebration. Good morning. 
Please join us in the call to celebration, both in your handouts and on the screen. Christ Please stand is risen. If you are able. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The joy of Easter still sings in our heart. We open our hearts to all the wondrous work God has for us to do. Welcome to worship this glorious day. Let, Let our, our lives be testimony, testimony to, to God's, God's redeeming, redeeming love. love. And now if you please st remain standing and join us in the opening hymn, number 261, Lord of the Dance.
Good morning. As we gather for worship together, you'll notice that Reverend Larry isn't with us this morning, so I think this is a situation of when Dad's away, the kids will play. We're going to have a good time worshiping together. Larry is taking some time away after the busyness of Holy Week, so we uh, keep him in our thoughts and prayers as he rests a little bit. Let's take a moment now to greet one another with the love of Christ. the children making their way forward. We have all of the children making their way forward. Good morning. Does anyone ever ask any of you for identification? Well, Liz, here's what the response was. Uh, well, no. But Liz was shaking her head yes. I get asked for identification all the time. One of the things that I get asked about is producing a driver's license. Why do you think I am asked to produce my driver's license sometimes? Well, if I want to write a check or use my credit card at the store, they ask me for my driver's license. So why do you think they ask me for that? And I have it right here. What do you see on this? My picture. And what does that picture tell the person that's asking me for identification? that I do have it and that the picture is a picture of, of me. They want to make sure that I am who I say I am. When Jesus rose from the grave and presented himself to the disciples, there was one who was not there. His name was Thomas. And he said, unless I can see the, the nail holes in his hands and in his feet, and unless I can put my hand in the place where they pierced him in the side, I will not believe that he is who he says he is. Will you believe that Jesus is who he says he is if you have not seen him with your own two eyes? 
Yes, and why? And that is what is known as faith. Jesus said to Thomas, when Thomas was able to put his finger in the hands, Jesus said, you believe because you've seen me with your own eyes. But blessed are those who believe who have not seen me. Well, you believe because you have not seen. That's a question. The answer is, yes. It's a torturous yes, but it's yes. You will believe because you have not seen. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for not only these children, but all of our children. We thank you, Lord, for those adults in their lives that lead them to you, that teach them about you, so that they too can lean upon the faith of believing without seeing. And it is in the name of yourself, your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, that we pray and we thank you. Amen. Amen. So now you can go to Sunday school with Liz. As we enter a period of prayer and we share our joys and concerns with one another, one joy that we have is all the different ways that we can do ministry together as a community. And so as we celebrate that, as we lift those things to God, I want to invite you to um, take note of all the different ministry opportunities that are in the bulletin and on the calendar. And I wanted to highlight just a couple. Uh, one is the, the Daughters Dinner that's coming up, sponsored by the United Methodist Women. There's a big beautiful color, colorful page in there about that. If you are interested in that and would like to sign up, um, you can see Kathy Wagner, who was going to announce it, but she lost her voice, and she's going to be here up front after the service, and she's right here, so you know what she looks like. Um, also, not in the bulletin, but since I have the mic, I want to announce that our young adult group is meeting this Thursday at 8 p.m., um, and if you're interested in that, you can see me after the service. So we lift up all of those things, and we lift up all the joys and concerns that are on our hearts, and I want to invite you now to share your prayers with the community if you feel led. What are the joys and concerns on your hearts?
I have a tremendous joy to share with everyone. As you all probably know by now, um, my closest friends, Brian and Kenny, have been fostering <laughs> Bailey and Xavier and Xavion. And on Friday, Linda and I had the pleasure of going to court and watching them become officially adopted by Kenny and Brian. And <laughs> it was a wonderful emotional day and it was very exciting. Stand up, stand up. So this is Bailey. <laughs> she doesn't shy away from attention, but for today she is. Where's Xavier? There he is, he's over there. And Zay is in the back. <laughs> So we're all very happy, and I'm sure they are too. And they're, anyhow, it's just nice to see them recognized now by the course as an official family. We, we are so joyful, and we lift up Brian and Kenny and Xavier and Xavion and Bailey to God, and we pray for their family as they. If you would please join with me the unison prayer both in your bulletin and also on the screen. In our songs and in our words, we give praise to you, Lord. In our worship, study, and service, we bless you. Loving God, you breathe life into us. You love us and care for us. For all that you have done, for all that you have given us, we worship you. Beautiful Savior, with all that we are and with all that we have, we offer you our thanks and our praise. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, in whom we know the power of redemption, we stand among you in the shadows of our time. And Lord, in the shadow of these times, we face again communities of faith who have been traumatized by senseless violence. Communities in Sri Lanka and San Francisco. As we move through every sorrow and trial of this life, uphold us with knowledge of the final morning, Lord, when in the glorious presence of your risen Son, we will share in his resurrection, redeemed and restored to the fullness of life and forever freed to be your people. Open our hearts, Lord, to your power moving around us and within us until your glory is revealed in our love of both our friends and our enemies, in communities transformed by justice and compassion, and in healing all that is broken in us, in our lives, in our communities, and Lord, even in our church. Guide us in the path of discipleship so that as you have blessed us, we may be a blessing to others, bringing the promise of the kingdom near by our words and our deeds. And now, Lord God, with the words of our hearts, as we remember the words of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, we pray the prayer that he taught his disciples when they asked for his guidance. As we now pray, our Father, 
who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It's now time for us to share in our gifts as we offer up our gifts and offerings at this time.
Today's scripture reading is from John 20, 19 through 31. It was still the first day of the week. That evening, when, while the disciples were behind closed doors because they were afraid of the Jewish authorities, Jesus came and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And when his disciples saw the Lord, they were filled with joy. Jesus said again, peace be with you. As the Father sent to me, so am I sending you. Then he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, they are forgiven. If you don't forgive them, they are, they are not forgiven. Thomas, the one called Diamas, because he was one of the 12, wasn't with the disciples when Jesus came. The other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he replied, and lets I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger in the wounds they left by the nails and put my hand into his side, I won't believe. After eight days, his disciples were again in a house and Thomas was with them. Even though the doors were locked, Jesus entered and stood among them. He said, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here, look at my hands. Put your hand in my side, no more disbelief, believe. Thomas responded to Jesus, my Lord and my God. Jesus replied, do you believe because you see me? Happy are those who didn't see and yet believe. Then Jesus did many other miraculous signs in his disciples' presence, signs that are not recorded in this scroll but these things are written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, God's Son, and that believing you will have life in his name. Yeah. The word of God written by the people of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. My three-year-old son, Desmond, is in the infamous questions phase of childhood development. I'm sure some of you might know what I'm talking about. Almost anything I could say is immediately followed by a very inquisitive, why? 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 Honestly, it's one of the more irritating things I've ever experienced. <laughs> one of my favorites, though, is uh, Desmond will often ask, you love me? And to which I respond, yes, we love you, I love you. And he follows up quickly with a, why? It's a sometimes strangely difficult question to answer, but it's beautiful, <laughs> that sentiment of why? Why is there this love between us? But that, that question, why? My life as a parent seemingly is a long string of unanswerable questions. My life as a Christian sometimes feels the same way, a long series of unanswerable questions. I feel like I approach my faith a lot like Desmond approaches life right now, following up anything anybody says about faith or theology with the question, why? Why do you say that? What does that mean? Is that true? I am a naturally inquisitive person but I think it's more about the fact that I, as a person, don't like our notions of faith and theology to go unchallenged. I'm a contrarian, but I like to think deeply about the things we believe. So I ask the question, why? It's in questioning our beliefs like this that we come to know what they really are. As a theologian named Paul Tillich, one of my favorites, says, doubt is the necessary tool of knowledge. Before I was a, uh, a working preacher, my wife Natalie would hate going to church with me because in her words, I asked her about it this week, how would you describe what I was like to go to church with? And she said, you would overanalyze everything and you wouldn't let me just appreciate worship. I, I think that's true. I couldn't shout out like Desmond does, why, why, why all the time. So at the end of church, she would always get those questions from me like, why do you think they said this? do you agree with this? She said it was sometimes a little difficult. 
Honestly, even now that I'm preaching, I can't always get away from that habit. I have on a few occasions come home after preaching and said something along the lines of, I said this in my sermon, and I'm not sure I entirely agree with that theologically. (laughs) So if you've ever been unsure about whether or not you can question the preacher, disagree with the preacher, just know that I disagree with myself some of the time when I'm preaching, so I think it's okay. I would imagine a lot of you are like me, theologically inquisitive, questioning things, challenging ideas, always asking why, looking to get to the root of what our beliefs are and what they mean. Our regular young adult gathering is this idea. It's called fermenting faith, and it's rooted in the questions of asking the difficult questions. To ferment means to incite or to stir up, and our gathering focuses on asking difficult questions of faith as we wrestle with them as a community of faith. It makes for some really good debates, some really good conversations, and to me that's a big part of what it means to be a community of faith. It's not just the experience of worshiping together, not just the experience of serving the community together, but the experience of asking these big questions together. Not always getting to answers, but being able to ask these questions. The idea of questioning is rooted in one of my favorite topics of spiritual life, doubt. Questions are the outcome of internal doubt. We ask questions because we're doubting or we're unsure about things. As we read the the Gospel of John this morning, it's one that has really shaped the church's understanding of doubt through the centuries. Thomas has the unfortunate or maybe fortunate legacy of being the founding father of Christian doubt. Often we say doubting Thomas as a sneer, with scorn, turning up our noses on the idea that he would doubt in that moment. But think about it for a second. Thomas had just witnessed the horrific death of a man who he loved dearly, his teacher, his leader, and his friend. He had watched him crucified. He had seen him buried. And then his other friends, the disciples, tried to convince him that he had risen from the dead. I'm sure if we're being honest with ourselves, any of us put in that situation would have been a little skeptical. Thomas gets a bad rap, historically speaking, for something we all experience and would have responded in very similar ways. Doubt. Doubting Thomas. To me, it says something pretty incredible that the people closest to Jesus, the people who had witnessed his miracles, had walked with him as he served, doubted. Even they had questions. The disciples were people. And as people, they doubted, because it's inherent in humanity to doubt. But it's Thomas, over and above the other disciples, that we remember for his doubts. So I want to ask the question this morning, what do we believe about doubt? I think a telling example of what our culture teaches about doubt is the story of Mother Teresa. She was in her life, the picture of a faithful person in the eyes of many, taking a vow of poverty, dedicating her life to those who were in the most need. She left the comforts of her world and moved to Calcutta, where she set up a center to care for the dying poor of India. She was, to so many, an inspiration as a person of faith. But shortly after her death, A book was published of her letters that she had written during her time in Calcutta. And the thing that stood out to so many people was that in these letters, they showed doubt. Mother Teresa, this woman who was the epitome of faith to so many, was consumed at moments by doubt. Here's what she wrote in one of those letters. I call, I cling, I want and there is no one to answer, no one on whom I can cling, no one, alone. Where is my faith? Even deep down, right in there is nothing but emptiness and darkness. I remember 
when this book was published, people kind of freaked out a little bit. People couldn't come to terms with her doubt. And I think that she, like Thomas, is now remembered in part for her doubt. It became a defining characteristic of how we remember her. But it shows you a little bit about how we perceive doubt in our culture. That when someone admits doubt, when someone has these doubts, we freak out a little bit. We question what that person is doing because of their doubt. We assume culturally that we're not supposed to doubt and that the people who are the epitome of faith shouldn't doubt. People questioned after that was published whether we should hold Mother Teresa up to be revered because her inner struggles were revealed. It's sad, but I think in the midst of her doubt, in the midst of her inner turmoil, Mother Teresa understood this about our world. She lived in fear that if people knew her doubts, that she would be cast out. She wrote about how she was afraid that people might understand what was going on in her and question what she was doing because of it. I wonder if some of us live in the same fear. That if the people around us, if our families, if our church knew the doubts that we have, that we would be cast out. I wonder if that fear is valid. I wonder if we cast people out when they express doubt or questions. I wonder if we hide it because of that. Mother Teresa hid her doubt well, feigning confidence in the public eye, in her faith. The story of Mother Teresa is a tragic one because it reveals how misguided beliefs about doubt can cause even the most spectacular people to live isolated lives, fearful of what the world might say if only they knew their doubts. The disciple Thomas doubted. Mother Teresa doubted. Yet, we can still hold them up as pillars of faith. Mother Teresa, despite her doubt, was able to work caring for the sick and sharing the love of Christ with countless people throughout her life. She shows us that doubt does not preclude us from practicing our faith and caring for one another with love. And I think is, that's the beauty of her story and the beauty of being human. There's a song by a band called Nickel Creek, not Nickelback, it's an important distinction. Nickel Creek is, a, is like a bluegrass folk band. Um, but they have a song called Doubting Thomas, and it contains a line that has really stuck with me for a long time. They sing this, can I be used to help others find truth when I'm scared that I'll find proof that it's a lie? Can we overcome our fears of doubt in order to care for one another? I think if we learn anything from the story of Mother Teresa, it's that we as Christians, we as a community of faith must stop scapegoating doubt. We must stop thinking about doubt as something terrible that plagues us or hinders us in our lives of faith, but something that is part of our lives of faith. When we fake certainty and disparage people who admit doubt, we create a world where people feel isolated and alone in their questions, unable to be honest about their own beliefs and struggles in the community of faith. And that, to me, is a huge problem. When people can't bring all of themselves into the church, even their disbelief, even their questions, then we are not being the community that God is calling us to be. But I think the problem goes deeper than that. It's not just about how we respond to doubt, but what we believe about doubt. It's the fact that we have internalized this message that doubt itself is wrong, that doubt is somehow a sin to be repented for. But I don't think that's the case. Because I think belief can only exist. Faith can only exist if there is doubt. They're two sides of the same coin. If we didn't have doubts, we wouldn't have beliefs. We'd have facts. And faith is not about facts. I always get frustrated when I hear uh, fundamentalist Christians attempt to argue with scientists about scientific things. 
as if Christianity and science were somehow competing ideologies. But they're not, because science is about empirical truth. It's about those facts. But faith is about existential truth. For example, evolution can be true, and we can owe our existence to a loving and compassionate creator. Beliefs are different than facts. And because of that, doubt is an inherent part of what we do as people of faith. I have heard people claim not to have doubt, and I can tell you with fairly good certainty that they were either being dishonest with me or dishonest with themselves. But frankly, I don't blame them. Think again about how the world responded to Mother Teresa when word of her doubts was made public. It's easier for us to deny our doubts, to feign certainty than to admit it and risk being ostracized or isolated from our communities of faith. But I want to tell you, at least from my perspective, and I hope that we as a community can embody this, that it's okay to doubt. It's okay to express your doubts. You'll still have a place in this community. Remember, even Christ had his moments of doubt. Remember his prayer in the garden. God, if it be your will, let this cup pass me by. Jesus was fearful. Jesus doubted the path before him, doubted his own ability to withstand what was coming. If even Jesus doubted, why would we expect to be any different in our lives? Some of our doubts are intellectual, and some are more rooted in our experiences. The intellectual doubts, to me, are the fun kind of doubts. They're the theological doubts, the questions of faith that we can sit around and debate and philosophize about. But the doubts rooted in life experiences are sometimes the more difficult, the more tumultuous, the more trying doubts, the ones that call our deepest sense of who God is and who we are into question. But that doesn't mean we should avoid them or minimize them. These are the moments where we encounter suffering that challenges our belief in an all-powerful and all-good creator. When we see the images of people around the world suffering, when we see so many senseless acts of violence like what happened in Sri Lanka or what happened in the synagogue in California recently, when it seems like evil and suffering are triumphing over good in our world, it's hard not to experience a deep existential doubt. It's hard not to experience doubt when we encounter suffering either from a distance in the world around us or much closer to home. Many of you know that my daughter, Rosa, who's one, was in the hospital a few weeks ago. It was a very uh, serious respiratory issue. Because of a blockage in her lung and an infection, she couldn't breathe properly and wasn't getting enough oxygen to her blood. During her time in the ICU, she was totally sedated, with breathing and feeding tubes and IVs in her arm and in her leg. There were many times that I was by her bedside that I had the inclination to pray. But to be totally honest, there were other times when I would look at her lying there, helpless and sick, alive only because of the machines pumping life into her body, and think, to myself that if she doesn't make it through this, if she doesn't get better, I don't know if I will be able to trust God or to even believe in God again. It was a moment of deep existential doubt. It's one that I'm certainly still processing. And as my community of faith, I invite you to be with, be with me in that. We all experience doubts. Both these personal experiences of suffering that leave us questioning, as well as the intellectual, theological doubts that we might have. Doubt is the inevitable consequence of faith. Author Anne Lamott says it like this, I have a lot of faith, but I am also afraid a lot and have no real certainty about anything. She continues, the opposite of faith is not doubt, 
but certainty. Certainty is missing the point entirely. Faith includes noticing the mess, the emptiness, the discomfort, and letting it be there until some light returns. The opposite of faith is not doubt, but certainty. Pretending that we have to be certain about everything prevents us from asking important but tough questions about what we believe. And I think that it is in those moments of difficult questions, in those moments of life and faith, where we encounter doubt, that we find God. Alfred Lloyd Tennyson says the same thing slightly differently. There lives more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. There lives more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. Now, there isn't a group quite as practiced at faking certainty than preachers. There's a certain level of pressure to have the answers, to speak with authority from the pulpit without doubt, to set an example of certainty and faith. But that's wrong because it sets up a model for people that is unsustainable and untrue. Pastors have doubts. Preachers can doubt. And they can be so overwhelming because often, like Mother Teresa, people in leadership feel that, fear that by admitting doubts, we will no longer be fit, seen fit to care for the people the way God has called us to. But if we take Thomas seriously, if we take Anne Lamott and Alfred Lloyd Tennyson seriously, then we need to see that certainty, not doubt, is the problem. Certainty, not doubt, is the problem. So if you're hearing a message of certainty from leaders of faith, then that's a problem. We should be wary of people who claim to know without a doubt what truth is. It makes me sad to see people admit doubt with a sense of shame. People who admit doubt as if there was something wrong with them for doubting. It breaks my heart because they have internalized a message about doubt that I think is misguided. Because when we internalize that message and we think there's something wrong with us because we have these questions, because we have this doubt, it can be so overwhelming and so difficult. So do not be afraid or ashamed to admit your doubts. Proclaim doubt boldly. Ask your questions of God and of people boldly. Because what happened in the upper room when Thomas admitted doubt? When Thomas asked his question, when he expressed his skepticism? Jesus showed up. That's what happens when we ask questions, when we wrestle with our doubt. God shows up for us. Not in a way that gives us an easy answer to our questions, but in a way that guides us through understanding and gives us a deeper wisdom. That, to me, is what the resurrection is about, what the Easter story is about. We can admit our doubt, we can live in that doubt, and Jesus will be with us, comforting us, guiding us, loving us. Faith is about growth. If we live a life of certainty without doubt, then we have no room for growth. Doubt is what inspires growth. And to me, that is why doubt is a spiritual discipline. Doubt is what inspires growth. So it becomes a practice for us who want to grow deeper in our faith and understanding of who God is. We doubt. We ask questions. And we get to know God and God's love a little bit better because of it. It seems clear to me that God intends for us to struggle with great questions of life and faith because there's no easy answers. The outcome of a good, doubtful question is not necessarily a compelling or good answer, but just the process of being able to wrestle with things. When we struggle, when we crest question, God does not isolate us or push us away. Jesus did not rebuke Thomas for his doubt, but invited him closer, invited him to touch and to understand more deeply the resurrection. 
It's through our questions, through our doubts, that God invites us closer into a deeper wisdom and knowledge about God's love. So don't be ashamed of doubt. Don't run away from the questions. Practice doubt as a spiritual discipline. Ask the tough questions. Because we're, when we're able as a community, as individuals, to speak openly and honestly about our doubts, about our struggles, that's where our faith can be strengthened. That's where our community can grow closer to one another and closer to God. Faith, true faith, can only exist when there is doubt. That's the real legacy of doubting Thomas, an image of true faith. There lives more faith in honest doubt than in half the creeds. So let us trust God and love one another in the midst of uncertainty. Amen. Please stand as you are able and let us join together now in our closing hymn. You are reminded to join us downstairs for a time of fellowship and food immediately following worship. And now receive the benediction. May the loving power of God which raised Jesus to new life strengthen you in hope, enrich you with his love, and fill you with joy eternal. And all of the faithful people of God say, Amen. Amen.